Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. Hello, everyone. Welcome to This Week in Global Development. My name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I'm filling in as host for this edition. I want to welcome my colleague, Sarah Jerving, who's a senior reporter here at DevEx based in Nairobi, who covers global health for us. And I also want to welcome our special guest today, uh, Jen Cates, who's the Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, Jen, you've been a great source to me over the years, I know, and looking forward to your insights today. So thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks. Good to be here again. So I, I, I wanted to actually start with an interesting tidbit that Sarah told me earlier today. And, and um, Jen, I don't know if you remember this, but Sarah told me that you were her point person on a Kaiser Family Foundation funded fellowship that she did 10 years ago, which was her first foray into global health reporting. So happy we could have a little reunion today. That's right. That's great. Um, hi, Sarah. Happy, yeah. happy decade. Uh, hi, us. Jen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Great to connect with you again yeah. and, and great to, to chat with you, Adva, as well. So, Sarah, I wanted to turn to you because I know there's a story that um, we published this week that you have spent a lot of time reporting and it gets to the heart of some of the challenges at stake in this broader localization conversation that's being had about getting more local organizations involved in um, USAID-funded projects. So can you fill us in a little bit about what happened in this um, sort of dispute between the Ghana-based Youth Opportunity and Transformation in Africa Organization and CARE Ghana? Yes, absolutely. Um, thanks, thanks, Adva. Um, so we published a story on Monday, and it's yeah looking at a dispute between um, the Ghana-based uh, Yoda local organization, and it is in dispute with Care Ghana over a decision to raise its own salaries uh, among its staff. And that happened during an economic crisis where inflation was spiraling and uh, staffers found it very difficult to make ends meet. Um, so it was a U.S. Department of Labor uh, funded project, which was aimed at protecting women and girls from exploitation in Ghana's cocoa sector. Um, so the budget was set in U.S. dollars at the onset of the, the program, um, but expenses such as salaries were made in local currency, um, which happens quite often. But it was a five-year program and the, the salaries stayed the same. Uh, so the country went through an economic crisis and the purchasing power of those salaries uh, dropped quite significantly. And Yoda said that these salaries were below market value and that they were losing their staff to other organizations because of this. Um, so Yoda decided to raise the salaries and included those raised salaries in an extension budget for the project. Care Ghana then a few months later raised objections about the salaries and asked that this money be paid back. Yoda argued it was within its own rights as an autonomous organization to raise the salaries. Um, they also said they depend on donor funds without adequate discretionary funds. Uh, so this would require the organization to amend contracts, request staff return increases, and then also retrieve payments made to tax authorities and pension schemes. And Yoda has also accused CARE of withholding money from, uh, from it beyond the funds in contention over the salary dispute. And this has put the organization in rough shape financially. Um, so this story documents the back and forth between these two organ organizations. Um, I looked through documents over the span of the five-year program and kind of in particular the last year as the two organizations um, kind of had the, the arguments about this. And uh, so Car CARE's argument is that the increased salaries violated U.S. donor regulations in two ways. 
Um, they say that the increases should have been made across all of Yoda's staff, not just those on the project, and that it should have been accompanied by independent market analysis. But just, just to back up a little bit, uh, to look at this on a more macro level, um, the story does raise questions around the conversations around localization and how that was the direct funding that was made available to Yoda, uh, which was none, um, as opposed to CARE, which received nearly half a million uh, dollars in indirect funding, which they can then use on overhead costs for the organization. So there is this sector-wide push to ensure that local organizations also receive adequate levels of indirect funding. Um, and then... An accountant uh, I had reviewed the details of this dispute said that this is a really common yet entirely avoidable problem and said that this is a case where an INGO puts um, strict restrictions on a national partner, far stricter than they would uh, put on themselves. And the national partner does their best to implement the program, but is kind of set up to fail. Um, so the story is a detailed look at some of the challenges in ensuring that local organizations are empowered in meaningful ways um, and could perhaps serve as a cautionary tale when kind of these partnerships are set up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting look. And just for context for folks who are listening, um, you know, the value of the Ghanaian CD dropped like 40% in this time period. So the actual dollar value of the salaries, right, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, wouldn't have increased and this project was initially allocated in dollars. So um, I, I think there, there are probably questions there that you're basically, I think the organization was trying to keep the salary at a level that people could then afford to live on, but because of these sort of technical issues that they're saying it's sort of in violation of policies. Jen, I, I'm wondering, I know particularly PEPFAR has done a lot of work with local partners. Have you seen challenges like this? And, and as the U.S. government looks to work more with local partners, do they need to make some changes in the way that they're allocating money, in the way that some of these you know, decisions are made or some of these regulations to prevent this type of challenge? Yeah, thanks. That was a fascinating article, Sarah. Um, I learned a lot from reading it. I think you know, thinking about PEPFAR's experience, you know, PEPFAR actually has a long history of localization efforts, and there have been definitely been rough patches. Um, so I guess one one thought I had was, you know, what can we learn from what PEPFAR has already done and what it how it approaches this, since it has already tra both transferred a significant share of its funding to prime recipients that are local as well as still has many that are big uh, international NGOs that do pass-throughs. So how, you know, this is, I think, such a good example of an unintended um, consequence of, of, of that that could be addressed. Um, but I, you know, I think it really, really raises, I mean, Sarah, I would love it if you could look at some of these issues more, more broadly because we could learn a lot about how to do this better. Sarah, is there anything else you wanna add on, on that story? I know you spent a, a lot of time, any, any sort of lessons that you've heard from people so far, sort of specific changes that people are calling for? Well, one of the, um, I spoke to uh, some leading labor and dispute lawyers in Ghana and one of the, um, you know, the, the things that they said is they, one of the issues with this program is that, um, or the organization, is it, it does have project-based staff. So they don't have like the continuity of in that sense. And so there's not a, a labor union associated with that staff. And um, the, uh, the, the lawyers I spoke to um, kind of independent from the two uh, organizations, they don't represent either. But they told me that kind of one of the methods that uh, labor unions would look at is kind of, you know, creating like a yearly, um, instituting a yearly increase for staff or looking at kind of when the government responds to like the minimum wage and changes uh, fluctuations due to the economy. That would be a signal to um, change the salaries of your staff. Um, but in this this case, they um, the organization had reached out. So they their participation in the program started in 2019. They reached out to Care Ghana in 2020 and said, "Look, these uh, these salaries are are quite low. We'd like to to raise them." They heard back, uh, "We can't do that. It's just the beginning of the program. We're in the middle of the pandemic." And so, um, yeah, so it wasn't like it wasn't this kind of yearly kind of look at where is the economy at. 
How is it impacting um, our workers? One of the things that um, the executive director of, of Yoda told me was that because the, the program um, was initially set in U.S. dollars and then kind of expenses were made in, in CDs, they actually, um, you know, they had, because of the, the weak exchange, there was actually more money in the project uh, of, at their disposal. So it wasn't, it didn't come at the cost of, um, of you know other things or kind of a request for more money um, in that sense because the the weak Ghana currency made it actually that there was more money available to the budget. You know, can I can I jump in and one other comment on this? Um, you know, this phenomenon of uh, project based staff, you know, supported by a, a grant or some kind of contract is not unique to localization. It happens all over the world. But I think the what this shows is that. The mechanism that, that if the conditions in which people are are working in the country economics are not taken into account, it really is could serve to undermine the not just the localization effort itself, but really any kind of sustainability. So I think it, it, the story really points to the challenge that um, international donors are going to need to deal to address to ensure that there's continuity and sustainability, even if the economic conditions change. The world is facing a range of health threats, from an increase in disease outbreaks to the health impacts of climate change. I'm Janelle Ravelo, Senior Global Health Reporter for DevEx. Every Thursday, we bring you exclusive news and insights on how the health sector is finding solutions to these challenges in our free weekly newsletter, DevEx Checkup. Visit devex.com newsletters to subscribe. A, a couple stories this week that looked at sort of um, trade policies. One of them, um, my colleague Rob wrote, which was looking at a European Union law to tackle deforestation. Um, and actually, Mia Motley came out and said that this could actually have pretty negative impacts, particularly for African smallholder farmers. The, the law is put in place to try to um, limit deforestation, and so it would end the import of goods um, whose production causes forest loss. But sort of the implementation of that could have, you know, a really challenging I- impact in um, emerging markets, particularly in Africa. And I think the other story that we looked at from a trade perspective this week takes a look at a leaked draft of a new free trade deal between India in the European Free Trade Association. And it's really um, spurred fears that India would impose, you know, stricter intellectual property laws on its pharmaceutical industry. And the Indian market has been really, really critical in supplying generic and cheap drugs for a number of diseases around the world. We certainly saw that with COVID. I know it's a key supplier in the in the HIV space. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, get both of your takes on 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 this sort of trade um, intellectual property issue. Jen, what what would the sort of impact be to global health if we saw a sort of significant restriction in India's production of uh, generic drugs? Yeah, so that the article points out um, this sort of longstanding challenge and issue um, with with creating access to medicines, to needed medicines. Um, and it's this tension between IP protection and um, and access. And I think what's interesting and important here is that uh, to some extent, the arguments and the challenges are the same as we've been having for many, many years, but the context has really changed. And as pointed out, I mean, with India being such a critical uh, producer and supplier of generics, um, this, if, if this shift, if you know, the leaked document suggests that there would be more IP protections instituted, which would reduce access and or in terms of uh, timing. And that could have a huge impact. I and mean, you mentioned COVID. We can all think back at the time when India couldn't actually uh, export um, COVID vaccines for a period. And that really, uh, you know, undermined a lot of the uh, effort to get COVID vaccines to low and middle income countries and during that period. So just think about this bigger context. And I think this this debate as it's playing out is, you know, it really could have a significant impact on access for so many people. But it also um, just speaks to this larger sort of nut that we haven't cracked. How do we resolve these 
tensions that are going to be between industry um, and access and, and need for drugs where we have such shortages. Because the, the argument that industry makes is that if you don't have sort of these limitations on intel or restrictions around intellectual property, that it's going to limit sort of the incentives for the private sector to do um, R&D and to innovate and to create new drugs. I mean, what do you make of that argument? Can, is there a middle ground? Yeah, so that, that argument is not a new argument, and it's been made um, over and over again. It's made in the United States. It's made outside of the United States. I think the evidence is mixed on whether that is, is the case. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, if the old, given that the, the access is, is so critical, um, there, I think everyone is trying to forge ahead with a middle ground, um, but recognizing the new context and the critical role that India plays, it seems like this, there has to be some kind of different pathway to address this challenge. I mean, I think in, in that context, one of the things, Sarah, that you've been following, I think is particularly important, which is efforts to ramp up pharmaceutical manufacturing on the African continent, right? To build supply chains on the continent that maybe make it, you know, less impacted by, you know, potential decisions elsewhere. Um, but there have been challenges there. Local producers are struggling to achieve financial sustainability. I know uh, we released this uh, list of 24 development organizations to watch this week. Um, and, and two of the organizations on there are really sort of dealing with this pharmaceutical challenge. And so I'd love to, you know, get your take. I know one of them is the African Medicines Agency. How could that help change the equation um, if that finally gets up and running. Absolutely. So that's been a huge um, priority of African leadership uh, in the wake of the pandemic is to really build that kind of public health uh, security. And a huge component of that is manufacturing. And um, there's something like 1% of vaccines, for instance, that uh, are consumed on the, the continent or actually produced on the continent. And the African Union is hoping to, to increase that to 60%. So there are um, some initiatives across the continent. Um, there's kind of this idea of, of creating regional hubs of um, uh, vaccine manufacturing rather than uh, having this uh, production happen in every country. So we have Senegal, we have Morocco, we have um, Rwanda, um, South Africa. Um, and a few other players. Um, so, so yes, as you mentioned, though, um, we did launch our 24 orgs in the development sphere uh, to watch this week. Um, and uh, African Medicines Agency is there. Um, it's a new uh, AU agency that's going to be aimed at harmonizing pharma regulation, or regulations across the continent. That's huge because, um, for instance, uh, if a local manufacturer uh, is based in Kenya, um, they cannot uh, access the full continental um, market. Um, they would need to register their product in individual countries, and that can be expensive, it can be burdensome. So there's a lot to be done kind of in ensuring that there's kind of smooth um, regulations across the continent. Um, so this new agency will also like work to guarantee quality medicines can be produced locally and then sold um, not only on the continent, but abroad. Um, so they're setting up shop in Kigali um, and pulling together their governing board. And um, we're also keeping an eye on when they hire a director general and then um, kind of fill that office in Kigali with new staff. Um, the new agency is also currently piloting a continental process for evaluating medical products and just launched uh, recently a new uh, technical committee that is uh, focused on pharmacovigilance, uh, that word's hard, pharmacovigilance <laughs> and safety surveillance. Um, another, uh, another one that we have on our list is the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation, and that will help uh, facilitate uh, technology transfer agreements uh, between international pharmaceutical companies and African countries. And there's largely been a stalemate in the, the tech transfer uh, sphere to local manufacturers in Africa. And so we're watching to see kind of what sort of uh, impact this foundation can have. Um, so their new offices will, are also in Kigali. Um, it's the first year of the operations for the new foundation, and it was uh, soft launched by the African Development Bank in 2022. 
Um, but, but yes, they just started work in January and are expected to grow their staff size significantly this year. Um, and then finally, uh, another organization we're keeping an eye on is Gavi, the Vaccines Alliance, um, which is in a year of transition. Um, Dr. Sonia Nishtar will take over leadership of the organization mid-March. The org retired its COVAX facility late last year. It also launched a new African vaccine manufacturing accelerator, um, which will, I believe, formally launch in June. And this year, the organization will also seek board approval approval for its new strategy 2026 through 2030 um, and launch its replenishment campaign in June. Um, So those are three orgs that we highlighted um, and they all have that link to uh, the local manufacturing um, and prioritizing that. Um, I would encourage everyone to check out the full list, which is featured on our homepage, which has a diversity of organizations in all in all of the sectors. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Jen, I wanted to turn to you. One, did we leave any organizations off that list that folks should be watching? But one, one organization that we put on there, and it, you know, I think Gavi Replenishment also, when I think about that, I think about the broader sort of funding picture for uh, global health and foreign aid in the United States. I know one of the organizations we put on there to watch is the House Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. Um, U.S. government, I think, is, or the Congress, I think, is close to reaching a deal that would avert a shutdown, partial shutdown this weekend, and sort of um, further delays coming up with a budget for the fiscal year 2024, which started um, on October 1st. And so I wanted to, I know, Jen, that you track all this stuff really carefully um, and wanted your take on sort of what the funding picture looks like in a year where there are a number of um, replenishments. We're also World Bank's World Bank Ida is looking at a replenishment and a really sort of challenging um, environment um, politically in Congress to get funding for these issues approved. Yeah, actually, I should, I love the twenty four and twenty four list, so I encourage everyone to go look at that. Um, it's a it's a great uh, not even a cheat sheet. It's really helpful. And when I read it through, I thought of a couple big themes that came out of it. One was already discussed, which is about local manufacturing. And that is you know, one of the positive trends that I think has come out of COVID, that acceleration of local manufacturing, but it's, it's not an, uh, an immediate solution as, as Sarah was noting. The second big theme that comes out of your list is, is funding. Um, and if you kind of go through talking about where the UK is on funding, where Germany is, where EC, there's a funding crunch. Um, and even though there's several organizations in there that are trying to look at increasing loan capacity and innovative ways to do that, I think the bigger picture is there's a big funding crunch coming. And at the same time, there's a lot of need. So there's Gabi's replenishment. You talk about the various green funds. WHO is having its investment um, uh, case uh, this fall um, and, and several others. So, and as also noted, the Gates Foundation is calling attention to this challenge. So which organization um, is is one of the, the holdups. And I think part of the challenge here is where the U.S. is. And you single out the House um, State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Committee. I would expand that to say it's really what happens with the U.S. government, not just in this ele- this congressional cycle, but with the election. But on the funding question, the immediate question of the U.S., it does look like there'll be uh, a shorter short-term deal again to avoid a shutdown. And kick some of this down for a little bit longer. The uh, bills that the bill that were um, would fund most global health and foreign aid is uh, was the original deadline there was the 8th of March. And that looks like it's going to be the 22nd of March. Unclear if, if that additional time is going to solve the challenges that our Congress finds itself in. And it could lead to um, potential funding cuts um, and of course, instability for organizations and programs that are trying to figure out how to how to continue with lack of certainty ahead. Um, everyone should know. I mean, the, the funding will come. It's just when and how much. But this speaks to a larger challenge. And uh, the one organization I think was that was left off. This is not a critique. Is 
the U.S. government, because what happens in November will dictate the future of this funding picture, I think, for, for you know, years to come. Even though it might not have made our list, it's definitely uh, high on our radar of things <laughs> of that we're covering this, <laughs> this year for sure. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think I think we'll all be watching what happens in, in the next few weeks and, and sort of how funding shakes out on a lot of these on a lot of these issues. And, and I think one other trend I would point out, I think, from the from the 24 and 24 list is that there's a lot of leadership changes. And so a lot of the organizations on that list are have new leadership in place or new leaders will be coming online. Um, and, and that's always, I think, interesting how or organizations navigate times of transition or, or new strategy. Sarah, I wanted to just see if there are other stories that stood out to you. I think, you know, we had an interesting story from, from Rob about Sudan. I think a lot of people are worried about the the situation there. And, and he wrote a story where he spoke to Baroness uh, Neville Rolf, the cabinet office minister in charge of the UK's Conflict Stability and Security Fund, who, you know, basically it, the UK in March 2021 ended um, a $3.2 million peace program in uh, Sudan. And as we all know, um, you know, the country has been riled by really awful civil war and, and violence and displacement. You know, cabinet minister told him, you know, sometimes you close things down because you think the money is going to be spent best elsewhere. And sometimes it's not the right decision. Um, I know the U.S. is also contending with, you know, leadership on, on this issue. And there's been, you know, saw a letter this week from some Republican congressmen and, and concerns there. But curious if, if there are other stories this week that stood out to the two of you that you want to make sure people know about. There was one that I was looking at just before we jumped on this, which is a, is a new fund really the answer to the next pandemic. And, um, you know, this is, I think you, your coverage of this whole issue around pandemic financing has been so good and helpful. So people who are interested in that topic, you can learn quite a bit from, from DevEx. But I think it raises this, this question. There's a, a, a tendency for um, stakeholders to seek a new thing every time there's a problem. And we're, we're in this situation where there's, a, you know, almost an, a, too many new things potentially. And it's very hard to understand how they all coordinate together and where the financing is going to come from all of them, even though there's a, uh, you know, there's seriously a serious financing challenge, both for pandemic preventive uh, support as well as response. So the article on is another new fund needed, which is one that, which is being discussed right now in regards to a pandemic treaty and, and um, other, other activities. I think it raises a really tough question for global health um, and how we solve this challenge, not just for pandemic financing, but for global health financing for the next decade. I think just to, to add another one, um, we reported uh, yesterday that uh, the U.S. is sending another $53 million to Gaza and the West Bank, um, which was announced by Samantha Powers, and that will go towards the World Food Program and other um, international NGOs. Um, and uh, the U.S. had previously halted funding to UNRWA um, after, uh, after Israel accused workers of being involved in the, the attack on October 7th. Yeah, thanks for, for raising that as well. I think, um, you know, given that sort of pause during the investigation, the, the funding wasn't going to go through UNRWA this time around. I think we'll be watching um, how all that plays out. Um, and I just wanted to thank you both, Jen and Sarah, for joining us today and for this great conversation. And hope you'll both be back on the This Week in Global Development uh, chat sometime soon. Thanks so much. Good to be here always. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you both. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.